Right, let's make a formal introduction for our listeners. Uh, good afternoon, Chester. My name is Claudia, and I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., uh, from the Student Fairfax City. We are very grateful that Chester Tons accepted our invitation to the show. Chester, welcome to the show, man. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's good to be here. Uh, no problem. Chester, let's go back to the beginning of your life. Uh, were you born like in a musical family? I mean, how old were you when you perhaps began taking, I don't know, guitar, piano lesson before before the drums? Oh, um, well, no, it was not really a musical family. Um, I'm the only one who had was a profession, became a professional musician. I, my oldest brother, I guess, played drums just with marching groups, you know, drum corps, but he never played drum set. Um, uh, but that born in Baltimore, um, when I was in, I guess, the seventh grade in school, I guess it was 11, 12 years old, uh, I wanted to join the school band. So uh, they give you the first lesson, you know, first two or three lessons and then everything else, you have to figure it out. And uh, but I, I had a friend in the family, uh, one of my brother's friends had become a professional drummer and offered to give me lessons on the drum set. So after maybe one and a half years, after two years of playing just in the school band, I started to go to his house, house to learn how to play drum set. And um, oh, yeah. and because I was at his house one day and someone called for a job that he was not interested in, but he asked if I was interested. And so, you know, I said, of course, yes. And uh, so he told them that, that he recommended me and told them I was 13. So they wanted to have an audition. So I did not have a drum set yet. He uh, took his drum set and I played the audition. They liked my playing. <clears throat> so I have one uncle who has enough credit to uh, go to the music store and get a used drum set. <laughs> and so uh, we went, I think this, the audition was a Sunday. We went Monday and got a used drum set. And uh, I started on the Friday. Friday night I played every weekend from the time, uh, bef from the summer before the ninth grade until I graduated high school, I played every weekend, <laughs> you know. Good so, for you, man. good for you. Were you getting paid for that or was free? Oh, for free? Yeah. In the beginning, I was making, I was getting very rich. I was making $5 a night <laughs> for three big, nights. Big money back in the day, man, right? So. Well, at 13 in those days, back in 1962, yeah. that was a lot of money. So I was, I was very happy. Um, yeah. But then, of course, the more I played and I started to meet more musicians and practice and learn more, I started playing uh, the nicer clubs in town. And and um, let's see, then when I finished high school, I did not go to university right away. Uh, at the end of that year, I think in December, I went, for, I, was, you know, I was always in a band. So we had a job in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, while we were there, we went to another club and just sat in and played. And they liked and they hired us, so we we uh, we would go there for six weeks at a time, and uh, and then just started traveling. I traveled for five years, just different different clubs, playing cover bands mostly. Yeah. The first lessons on drum set were all jazz. Everything was jazz, uh, and all of the early all the early gigs were playing soul music. Uh, but then. Maybe from 15, I started playing in jazz groups also. And uh, so my career has been crazy. I've played a lot of rock, a lot of soul music, a lot of jazz, you know, a lot of Latin. <laughs> for, for Chester, for people that they don't know, like I'm not a drummer, I'm not a musician at all, is it difficult to kind of with the, ba with the jazz background to play, you know, soul, R&B, you know, classic rock? It's a big like adjustment or I imagine so, right? Or no? All the musicians, everybody told me that if I can learn to play jazz, I can play anything. I got you. I believed it and that I think this is true because with yeah. jazz, it's much more um, independence. The feet and hands are playing something different, not the same pattern over and over. And yeah. because, because I started with this, I think it was much easier to learn other styles. Yeah. yeah, I got you, I got you. So then you were playing in 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 bank in high school. You graduated. Do you remember the the with the first one of the first courses that you ever attended? No, as a musician, but uh, as a, a spectator to see the you were yes. I read somewhere you were you were attending a lot of bands back in Baltimore, right? 
where you were? Yes. Uh, well, the first things I went to, um, Baltimore had a theater called the Royal yeah. Theater. It was like the Apollo in New York. Um, mm -hmm. Many cities that had a theater like this, well, not so many, but the same show would go from the Apollo. It would start, it would go to Chicago, uh, New York, Newark, New Jersey, Baltimore, Philadelphia. And so every other week when I was, from the time I was 13, I would go to almost every concert. And I saw, I saw early Motown. I saw James Brown. I saw Sam Cooke. I saw everybody. <laughs> I saw all of these amazing artists. Uh, almost every other week I would go to the show. And um, sometimes they would bring their own drummers and I would always try to sit close to the front so I could watch and listen to the different drummers. Yeah. And so, yeah, and then the first jazz concert I went to, I went with a friend to see uh, Cannonball Adderley. And this, I was in high school at this time, and this was amazing because I was always listening to a lot of jazz, but, but that was the first time I saw jazz musicians play live. It was incredible. Yeah. Well, at the same time, Baltimore, uh, when I was growing up, uh, from the time I was maybe 14 or 15, there were always jam sessions in different clubs in Baltimore. And I tried to go to all of them. Sometimes it would be two jam sessions a week, sometimes as many as four. And the really good jazz players would come out and I would go and learn from them and I, they would let me play and and they would give me, you know, if it was something I wasn't doing that, that correctly, then the drummers were very good. They would give me advice, you know. Oh, wow, good for you. So, and your parents were okay for that? No pressure to go to a school or, you know, you, 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 I so, imagine at the time you, you said, no, I want to be a musician. That's my, that's what well, I want to do in my life. Or? I, I tried to get other jobs. Nobody would ever give me a job. <laughs> so, yeah, so yeah. I always had some place to play. So, you know, it, it worked out. Well, I'm glad that they didn't give you a new job because maybe you would have left the drum set and, you know, Frank Zappa would have not met you and Genesis and all that stuff. So, and being <laughs> selfish. <man. laughs> good, good for you, man. And then, so you, you, so you you fall in love with the, you know drum lesson and, and jazz and feel free to elaborate about your your audition with Frank Zappa. I think that was your first professional band, could we say or no 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 no. Um, the first uh, big name uh, musician I, I toured with uh, was Ben E King from Stand by Me. Okay. Oh, uh, I see. I see. Yeah. yeah. I was doing a recording in New York. Uh, the band band I was in, I played with a guitarist uh, named O'Donnell Levy. He was my best friend growing up. We played in many bands together, but he had gotten a recording contract. So we went with our band to to the session in New York and they brought in other musicians. Um, the bass player on that session, his name was Lee Collins. He was Benny King's music director. That's and he invited, he invited me to come and do a, a short tour, just a small tour uh, with, with Ben E. King. Uh, we played in Canada and then the band went on and played some other places. After that, I played with a jazz organist named Jack McDuff. Um, I toured with him for a full year. After that, I decided to go back to, to go to college because I never went before. So I decided it was time to go to college. I wanted to learn more about music overall. And yeah. after, two, after two years of college, um, that is when I got an opportunity for an audition with, with Zappa. Uh, I, I, my friend, one of my friends was his tour manager. Yeah. And uh, from Baltimore, Marty Pirellis, he shows up in some of the songs, his, his name, you know. And um, so I got the audition with Frank and he liked my playing. So we started rehearsing that day, you know. How difficult was uh, there were a lot of people that auditioned for the gig or you No, only the, the saxophone player, the vocalist, uh, Napoleon Murphy Brock and myself, we uh, st started auditioning the same day. And he uh, Frank heard him in Hawaii. Uh, he was singing with some other bands there. <coughs> and he also played saxophone. So our, there was only just the rhythm section, uh, George Duke on keyboards, Tom Fowler on bass. And then we were playing and Frank playing guitar. So for the first two days, this is all there was. And then the third day, he brought in the complete band. There was there were two drummers. There was Ralph Humphrey, who was already in the band, and uh, Ruth Underwood and Fowler. You know, he brought the complete band in the third day. 
that's when I heard all the really difficult music. The first two days were very simple things. He just he had just written, you know. But the third day was very frightening when I heard the rest of the band. It was like I was a little bit worried. It's like, oh no, can I play this music? You know. So uh, we rehearsed for his rehearsals were always. He would rehearse for 40 hours a week, uh, five days a week, eight hours each day. And uh, after the rehearsal, I would go to my hotel, you know, I would eat dinner. When I go to bed, I'd wake up at two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning, practice for maybe two hours, go back to sleep, <laughs> get up, have breakfast, go back to rehearsal. So I did this every day <laughs> for one month to be able to play this music, you know. Wow, so I, I imagine the level of complexity, right? And then for how, so for how long did you, you stay with him before you end up leaving? Uh, I was close two years. Um, yeah, gotcha. I, I was quite happy to play with him, but he, he canceled a tour. And when I started to play with him, we were always traveling. I mean, not, there was not very much time off. We were traveling a lot. And uh, so when he decided to cancel a tour, I did not, um, I didn't really know many people in Los Angeles yet, so it was a bit, it was a little bit difficult to, I didn't know what I would do for work, you know. And so uh, my friend Alfonso Johnson, the bass player, we knew each other from oh, several years before this. This was all in 75. I started with Zappa in 73. So I knew Alfonso, we, we met each other and started playing together in maybe in 1969, something like this. And so he was playing with Weather Report and they were in town to rehearse and they needed a new drummer. So he uh, asked if I would like to come down and play with Weather Report. So I went down, they liked my playing. So I, I didn't have, like I said, I had no work. So I started touring with them. But Weather Report was my favorite band. So once I started playing this music with Weather Report, um, I had to call Frank and tell him I would not be back, you know, so. But he, he knew me well. He understood that that was really more, you know, the, the music, you know, that, that I love. That you like, right? More on the jazz front than in the rock. So in which well, but, right? but Weather Report, especially when I played with them, was really right in the middle. It was one of the really strong early fusion groups. Fusion, yeah, 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 yeah. Jazz background, but the, the rhythms were very intense, very, you know, very funky, you know. And they, they give you... For somebody, you know, at your level, when you go to a rehearsal with a new band, they allow you like a week to learn the tracks. And because I know you're very methodical, you need to write stuff down. I, I know they're not, not all the time. No, all the time I'm growing up, we learn by playing the record. <laughs> you know, you listen yeah. and you learn the part. I always read music. Yeah, I learned how to me read music very early, even before the drums. Yeah. Uh, but um, but I didn't. I, I, there was like a, a almost like a toy flute, uh, and, and I asked the teacher. Uh, she they would she would write numbers to tell you what finger. But I asked her to teach me to read music, and she did. This is when I was in the sixth grade. So when I started playing drums, I already could read basic music, you know. And um, so the music would, you know, yeah. Fortunately, I really studied a lot uh, because I wanted to get really good at reading music. So. Um, it came in very handy, of course, with Zappa, everything, he wrote everything. Um, and his music was really, really difficult, and which is why I had to <laughs> practice, you know, so much in the beginning. But after that, the reading music was, was much, was very simple for so many other things. But no, I, but I always, have, always had a good ear to learn and re remember things because of the beginning. Uh, with Weather Report, <laughs> Weather Report was amazing because for the first rehearsals, um, they would not, they would tell me when they explained the song, they would give me a scene. They would not give me a music to play. Like one of Wayne Shorter's songs, for example, uh, Wayne Shorter said to me, um, this song, I want you to think about, I want you to picture a caravan going across the desert. And that's all he said. <laughs> so when I heard the song, it completely, well, it made sense because that was that was the feel, you know, <clears throat> and it was easy to picture this. And so, so I, I like that. I like Albert Einstein's quote that imagination is more important than knowledge, you know, absolutely, absolutely. So yeah. I was able to able to have this picture 
And then so, yeah, I just knew. It. And so they, when it was a different song to play, they would normally give me like a, almost more like a movie. They would describe it more like a movie. And then and they would just, okay. I, I found, I, I liked that a lot. That was very, very good for me. Yeah. I'm going to, I got to check something. My uh, inner, we, uh, it's the wrong setting. Okay. Just, yep. It, take your uh, time. Okay. I think now it is okay. Ah, it did change. Sorry. Um, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 okay. Okay. Yeah, I think it's more stable. It's better, it's better now. I have I have more than one, one internet connection in my house, so I had to change oh. to the code. Okay. okay. And then so, and then you, what what happened? You end up leaving with a report, and then you went to Pointer Sister after that, right? So. Yes. Uh, yeah. After that, I did a lot of recordings. I did a lot of studio work. And studio work, right? Yeah. Auditions. So, yeah. I found out that Pointer Sisters were going to Japan, and I, I just found out from other musicians. So I I found out who to call, and I went and had to do an audition because they wanted somebody who could really read music well, because some of the some of the concerts they had a big band. This in the beginning, the Pointer Sisters were doing all jazz, and yeah. so. So they wanted somebody with a jazz experience that could read music. And so it worked out very well. I went with them. I stayed with the Weather Report. We toured for one year. And yeah. then we were making the recording Black Market. And um, there was a little bit of a crazy misunderstanding, which, which ended it. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a fantastic year that I played with them. I, you know, and... Um, The recording Black Market is still one of my favorite things. The first time, you Absolutely. know, yeah. my favorite albums that I, that I ever did. But um, after that, I people more people knew who I was, and I started to have maybe a little bit of reputation. And Pretty so, much. after the Pointer Sisters, I um, I had never done a Broadway show, and a friend of mine that they had called uh, to play the show when it came to New York. It was a hit show in New York, but but they always start a, a company in Los Angeles, which becomes a touring company. And the show was called The Wiz. Okay. And, and uh, I was very, I'm, and for me, I'm always interested in, in playing something I never played before. I'm, I'm not a purist. I don't want to play the same thing all the time. I'm always wanting to try something new. And I never did a, a real Broadway show before. So it was, for me, it was fantastic. And I met yeah. my also in the show and, um, uh, So from that, from that, while I was doing the show, um, Alfonso Johnson is very important again because he was a big Genesis fan. The first time I heard Genesis was, uh, yeah, the first time. No, it wasn't the first time. I actually, I heard, no, let me think about it. Yeah, the first time I heard Genesis on tour with Weather Report, Alfonso would play. A, We did a tour in Europe uh, on trains. We didn't take flights anywhere. We took trains the whole tour, which was fantastic. Yeah. And, and, and uh, Alfonso would very often be playing Genesis, uh, the Trick of the Tail album on his, uh, you know, cassette player, the big, the boom box. That's right. Yeah. And so that's, that's why I had an introduction to them. I, and he was a fan. So he met Phil Collins in a hotel in, in Los Angeles and they, they traded numbers. Obviously, because as it turns out, Phil Collins had come to the last Weather Report concert that we played together, which was in London. And um, so he met Alfonso when he was looking for another drummer. Uh, I guess he was interested in, in me. So he called Alfonso to find out how to reach me, which was good because I wasn't even in, at my home. I was in San Francisco staying with a friend. I got you. And I had spoken with Alfonso. So I got a call from Phil Collins one day asking, did I want to join Genesis? So after the time and uh, with the Wiz, I, uh, they sent me some cassettes to, to listen to the music. And so I went straight from the Wiz. I went to Chicago to help them find the next drummer. And then I went to England to start rehearsing with Genesis. This was in uh, like so you, 1966. Yeah. Uh, and then the so, first was 97, January 1st. So you... You arrived there before even met Mike Rutherford or Tony Banks, or so they 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 agree. 
So, yeah, Phil, so Phil, like Phil Collin make the decision on their behalf and say, this guy is good. Phil and said, you're, you're in? Wow. And Phil said to me that he played, I had, by, I had done several recordings by then, by this time. And Phil was very interested in a, a Zappa recording called Roxy and Elsewhere. And um, he played some of, you know, and because Genesis was, they did not have hit songs yet. It was all prog rock, all progressive right. rock. Yeah. And Zappa, because I had to play so many odd time signatures, it, you know, and all the, the prog, progressive rock stuff was almost, I mean, always changing time signatures. And so um, it was it was an easy fit, you know. So um, he played some things that I recorded and they, they told him, yeah, it's fine if, if you know, this, this guy will be fine if he wants the job, so. Well, so you, they give you a cassette, you start listening to stuff, but, you know, it's not the same thing, right? <laughs> well, it, was right. It, was only, it was only two weeks before I left, when he called me before I was in England. It was only maybe maybe three weeks on to complete, so I did not have time to really learn it. So we got there, and, um, you know, they did not really, they weren't used to changing drummers. I think Phil, Bill Bruford did, like, the first short tour they did when Phil was singing after, after Peter left. And um, and I guess they, you know, it turned Phil, Phil found out that Bill was not available for the next tour. And so I had the call. So they, we only had, oh, sorry, my mistake. We only had um, 10, we, they set aside 10 days to rehearse, but it was a two and a half hour show. So 10 days was not really good for, for that, that long a show with such, and the music was, wasn't, it was not as difficult as Zappa's music, but it was still very difficult with all the odd time changes. And so um, I said to them the first day, if you can give me a list of five songs for the next day, then I can prepare them, you know, you know, for the next day. So I would stay up all night and write out all the Phil Collins drum parts for every song. I wrote everything out on, on music paper. And then I would read it in the rehearsal and, uh, then I they give me another five songs to learn, and we we did that, uh, so I was able to to prepare. Yeah. Wow! Do you still have the notebook that you used to use to write? I wish I could find it. It would be worth a lot of money if I could find this book. Yeah. No, don't sell it it's for your kids. You know, for your for well, your son. You know, for your wife to keep it as a wow. I, I, I mean, I'm I'm sure it's in a box somewhere. I've moved many times since then, but and I'm sure it's in a box somewhere. But but I don't know where it is anymore. <laughs> Good for you, and it, it was um. So that was before there was Termer, so that you were the only American. Is yes. It, was it difficult? I mean, like the day to day, the the way they pronounce certain word, the stuff. Because <laughs> I I go to London very often, right? And I have an yes. accent, right? I wasn't born in this country like you have, right? It's um. It's not the same, like. <laughs> no, no. For me, I so I I Steve Steve Haggett speaks very well, good, very good English. The way I read the English, right? And right. Anton and uh, Anthony Philip too. But Mike Rutherford is hard for me to understand <laughs> what he's saying. He he openly. I mean, he way that the way he talks, the way he pronounces the word, are very difficult. It's not that easy for me to understand yeah. Mike Rutherford. Yeah. I understand. Well, if I'm talking to each one separately, it was okay. But after the show on the first tour, um, every night we would get together in one room and they would, everybody would be talking. I could never follow a conversation. It was very, very difficult, very lonely because I'm in a room. We're all supposed to be speaking English, but I could never follow a conversation. Talking to one person, I was fine. But when they, when I hear all the different accents and dialects, then it became, as you say, it was very difficult to understand. After maybe a couple of weeks, I could understand everything, you know, but yeah. and I had to learn to speak. I had to learn to speak a bit of British, you see, <laughs> to, yeah. you know, to make myself understand. I had to speak more like what they were used to because. Oh, yeah. For Peter, Peter Gabriel, it's very easy to understand him, but Mike, and Tony and Mike, Phil Collins, yeah, so what, you know, it, Remember that there are the other three guys. That four guy went to a private school, and right. you know, here we call it private. Down there in the UK, they call it public school, and they were right. more come from Polish family. You know, right. at, uh, Phil Collins did not come from that. No, no Phil, Phil cannot. Right, so Phil, Phil went to his his mother and another lady operated a art school. They called it a right. state. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, uh, but his accent, not quite Cockney, but he had a completely different accent again. So. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, the now, same so, slang, okay. you know, completely different slang words that mean opposite what they mean in America. So, yeah, it was crazy, the first tour. Well, so you were very kind of, uh, you could understand the beginning, and uh, and uh, and then on January, you guys went on tour. How many, you remember there was a long tour, a short tour? or more maybe one month maybe yeah maybe one month yeah yeah it was it was um yeah it was a little bit crazy it was um so yeah you know by the end like i say the by the end of the tour i understood everyone very well and i, I had learned i'd learned the slang words and it, it was very easy but it's so funny because when i when it, when i went back to america when i came home um even after the first rehearsals, I went to Baltimore to, to visit my family. And, when, you know, this, uh, this was just before Christmas. <clears throat> and so I went there for Christmas and my family immediately thought they started saying I sound, they thought I had an English accent because I had picked up so many of the words from there and, and the way they put it. Yeah, of course. They, yeah, yeah. To me, it's like I, I didn't think so, but they, they were very surprised. They thought, like, man, why are you talking with an English accent? You know? Yeah, but the, yeah. but there's a the funny story. The funny story is on the first tour, uh, the American slang. You know, in England, a few years ago, if they, they really really liked something, they would say, "Oh man, that's wicked," you know. And wicked, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. We would say, "Man, that's really bad," you know, meaning that we really like it a lot. And yeah. so they did not they did not understand that. They told me the second year we were touring in America. And Mike Rutherford told me one day, he says, uh, you, you know, the first the first uh, year touring, the first time, the first month especially, we thought you were going to quit the band. We had uh, meetings to decide to try to figure out what to do if you quit the band, because every time we would play something, you would say that's bad. And we thought you hated the music. <laughs> and uh, so they didn't Wait. understand. The, problem, the next year when they're in America and they hear other people say bad, they figure out what it means. And <laughs> That's correct, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> wow. I didn't wow. know this until the second year. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and then, and so, and then after that, Daryl Sterner joined, ended up joining Sterner, Jenner, right? I mean, so now there were two Americans, so. Yes, you, uh, yes. You, 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 I suppose it, it was... You you felt more in the comfort zone, right? Because well, after after hanging out with the guys and uh, I already I already knew Daryl because I I oh, see. yeah hear his band in Milwaukee. He was he was in a really good band, so I I already yeah. knew him. Uh, we had already met, so yes. Yeah, Daryl's a very nice fellow too. I met him several yeah. times. Here he played with a band with a Swiss head band here in Maryland, and uh, every time that he's in town, I go and see him and. Uh, oh, okay. and yeah, so he's yeah he's a very good person as well. Yeah, yeah in Annapolis. In Annapolis, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's absolutely right. Were you there at the show? No. No, I was in Baltimore, but I was I had a drum clinic that night, so I could not go to his show. <laughs> yeah, he played like a. That was I was there the same. Time. I, I forgot the I forgot the. Um, I forgot the venue, but I I know exactly where you told. Yeah. In, 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 in Annapolis, close to the Naval Academy down there, yeah. At, uh, and uh, it's a very, it's a, I, I go there often, but I go there, I don't know if you know the, the place called the Vishmer. Huh? The Vishmer, I don't know if you know the place in Alexandria. I don't know that one, no. Oh, it's very, it's very... Um, Where is it? V-I-R-C-H-E-M-E-R-E, -E -E, Vishmer. It's a very well-known venue, it's a oh, wow, it's classic. Okay. You know, it's it's a classic venue. Any okay. anybody yeah. who is in the business had played there at the beginning. And, oh, okay. uh, mm. It it's very well known place, it's a small club, right? So, like uh, five hundred people, right? Or so, but uh, but um, so then join. So they're all started join. You feel more comfortable, and then you you guys began touring a lot at the time, right? Or so, yes. right? We we toured. I came in for 77 tour, Daryl did the 78 tour. We did not tour in 79. Yeah. But then, uh, we started touring again in 1980. And it was a lot. And then Daryl and I both started, we both did Genesis, but we also did Phil Collins solo tours. So we were going, we would go on every year. One year Genesis would tour, Phil would tour the next year. And we, so we were doing both. It was a lot. Yeah. 
And uh, how difficult it is to be overseas all the time, touring and missing your 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 wife. I don't know if you have your son at the time or, or so, right? Well, the difference the difference with Genesis with most rock bands was that it was a very it was very much a family band. They were not okay. party, were not party guys, and so as soon as they start having hit songs, they would they would uh, charter one plane for the whole tour, so the families could travel. And well, so see, yeah. my my family traveled a lot in the early years when my son got a little older with school <clears throat> when he started school then we uh, would talk to his teachers and if i was gone for more than three weeks they would they would he would be allowed to come to come away for one week he would have his school lessons to complete while he was gone but they right. would come out with me for at least one week maybe sometimes maybe two weeks <clears throat> yeah, yeah. That made it a lot easier yeah yeah, and uh, plus you were making more money, so you have enough money to, yes. I suppose, stay, save, and better hotels, and, and all the, you know, the yeah. lecture, right? Yeah. Yeah, so. I understand. Any, any particular, you know, period of Genesis that you like better than than the other at the time? No, or? Yeah, the, the, for me, the very best tour was in uh, 2007. <laughs> okay, the, the, okay. After, yeah. We had that tour for 15 years. That's right, yeah. But when we did the tour in 2007, uh, there was no new album, and Whoa. they toured because they wanted to, just to play the music again. And um, we laughed every day, which was never, it was never that way be before. The early tours were, you know, I mean, we'd have good times, but on the 2007 tour, we, man, it was just, every day was just fantastic. We laughed every day, the shows went very well, and. For me, that was the best time. Yes, good for for you. Yeah, I, I, I in two seven, I saw Genesis like uh, uh, probably five or six times. Oh wow! And yeah, then the last, the last tour in twenty twenty two, mm -hmm. I saw them six times again. I, I, I saw mm -hmm. they play here in DC, right? Uh, and then I went to Boston for the last two gigs. That it would have been the. You know the fifty fiftieth anniversary uh, mm -hmm. on Genesis playing the United States. They, they played the first time around seventy two in in Boston, and uh, and then uh, and then they they postponed some gigs along the way. And so they the last three gigs they were in London. I flew. I told my wife I flew to London. I saw as Genesis for the last time, and then the last show. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, Phil as I said, okay, the guy, this is it. We are getting real job. We we are okay financially. We don't need the money. We don't need the house. We are getting all and uh, and uh, and they they end up you know. But then Genesis doesn't exist anymore, man. And uh, but of course, you know, and then they, I suppose that at the time they in twenty twenty two, you know, uh, Nick Collins, you know, ended up playing right. So you yeah. you you knew you knew him from when he was little, right? So I think I read somewhere that. You when he was five or six, you know, mm -hmm. sitting in his dad lap, you you know the man. This guy could be a good drummer under all, right? So, so oh, right? yes, yeah. It was, it was very clear that he would he would be a good drummer. You know. So yeah. then my, my life moved on. Like I say, after two thousand seven was my last time with them. After yeah, two thousand yeah. ten was my last time with Phil, and yeah. uh, and for me it was a great it was a good season in my life. But I think my life my career maybe really started after that in a, in a new way you know um yeah i started started to do my own albums and started to get more into writing music and stuff and um yeah i mean it would it, it, to me it's like another life i this this is another life i i don't even think about it anymore <laughs> we're talking yeah, about yeah. it's not something i mean i'm again like i say i'm always very interested in what is the new thing you know, I got you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. What, what's it, coming? It was difficult to play with Phil, you know, in Phil's band versus playing in Genesis. Genesis, uh, yeah. Phil, Phil takes on a lot of stress, and everybody feels it. You know. Oh, I see. Yeah. So Genesis, he's more relaxed because everything is not up to him. You know, he doesn't have to make every decision. So you know. Yeah. Must be difficult to run the, your own band because then. Probably if you so. are in the rhythm session or the drama or this, he... I really like to move on if we can. <laughs> huh? 
I'd like to move on. We, this is enough for Genesis. <laughs> yeah, I got you, got you. And then so so then you finish to seven, and then what what were you doing after after that, if you don't mind, with uh... Uh, freelancing, playing with a lot of different people. Um, right. I did, like I said, I did my first. Well, I did my first solo album in 1991, but it was okay. my first time. So it was yeah. some good. Things. There were some things that if I could do it again, I would do it differently. Uh, I, I, yeah. I ended up with a jazz trio in 2013. Uh, mm -hmm. Fantastic musicians here in Nashville. We we made two jazz trio albums. First okay. one moved, and then the second one was called Simpler Times. And um, we we got a lot of great radio play on the jazz radio stations. The first one in 2013 became number six in the country, and then the one uh, the next one, uh, simpler times, it became number four in the country. And uh, like I said, during this time, I'm doing a lot more studio work. Uh, like I say, a lot of freelancing uh, for the first time. So the, the last thing that I did, um, well, I did another one um, called Steppin. I uh, did that yep. one. Goodness, what was it, 2017, maybe? Something somewhere in that time. But I just recently, during COVID, I uh, spoke to people during, in the middle of all these other things, I finally had a band. Uh, first time I had a band, just we started, just friends getting together, and we would start having jam sessions. Um, the, a couple, Pee Wee and Michiko Hill, they have a, a daughter who's a fantastic singer, Judith Hill, <clears throat> and they tour with her a lot. But during COVID, the, nobody was touring and they had a really nice studio at the house and nobody was booking the studio. And so I called at the beginning of COVID just to see how they're doing. Like I say, they're good friends. And uh, they said to me, um, well, we're just sitting around jamming with the drum machine. Tours are canceled. Nobody's booking the studio. And yeah, wow. Now, of course, my answer is that, well, let me send you something to jam with instead of the drum machine. So I sent them a drum track. It's nothing but me playing drums. Yep. And they wrote a song around what I played. And they sent it back to me. And I, it, I was like, it blew me away. It was like, man, how in the world did you come up with this? You know? And they said, well, we just went where you led it. You know, which was very flattering, but still was was very shocking to me that because they wrote this great song on the album. Uh, it's the third track. It is called uh, Oh goodness, what is it? we changed all the names. As you probably know, names change many times before you come to the final names. Uh, I think it's high and sick. Is that uh, high and sick? I think right. Hide and seek. Yes, that's a, it's very good actually. No, I listened to the album yesterday, and uh, it this, is a this, very good album, man. So. The Hide and Seek was the very first thing that I sent to them, just only playing the drums and everything they wrote okay. around that. The second, so I said, well, let's, let me send you a different one, you know. So the next time, the next one I sent them, I sent them completely different feeling on the drums, which turned out to be number two, Sunrise. You know? That's right. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So the process took me maybe more than a year because as, as 22 went on, as 2022 went on, you know, finally people were able to play again and they were able to, you know, start and they were doing a solo album uh, as a couple as well. So after a year, we had completed it and then, uh, well, we completed our parts and then we added uh, guitars. Two of the guitar players were in, in that original band, Caleb Quay, who was uh, a lot of people knew from Elton John. He was in, well, Elton, actually, Elton used his first band on his early tours called Hookfoot. That was Caleb's band, actually. I see. And, I see. and uh, the other guitarist, Ronnie Van, did a lot of Motown sessions and played with uh, Dana Ross and several other people for many years. And um, so then my son is playing on three of the tracks, uh, playing guitar, Akil Thompson. And the engineer who mixed everything, his name is Brendan Harkin. He actually played guitar on one track. Uh, I mean, I hadn't. I knew he played guitar because I've been in his studio many times. And when you go in the studio, with guitars everywhere. And uh, I realized one one more song needed a guitar track. And I thought, and I asked him, "Is like, would you? Is this style of music okay for you?" Because, and man, he did. I thought he did a fantastic job, actually. So, um, yeah. And then there's a horn player here, saxophone player Jeff Coffin, who plays with Dave Matthews Band. I see. Yeah, I see. Yeah. 
another saxophone on one song, a girl named Sheila Gonzalez who plays in Dweezil's band, you know. Wow. Yeah. Weasel Zappa's band, yeah. So it was, and then there's a percussionist uh, who was a friend with Pee Wee and Michiko who, um, who played with them in their church. Very good percussionist. He heard this music and said, man, tell him I would love to play on this stuff. And I had thought about using percussion. And so we you know, gave him a couple of songs to check out. And he, I thought he played beautifully. So he played on several songs as well. And but so it took it took a long time for it to completely come together. But we were never in the same room at the same time. Nobody was ever in the same room except Pee Wee and Michiko, you know, which is which is pretty amazing. But we played so much when we had the band. I was very surprised that I think the feeling feels the same way it felt when we had the band, even though we did not play together for 30 years, you know. Uh, it was a pretty a very special project for me, yes. Any possibility of touring with the band, where you live? or in Right now they're in Europe with their daughter, Judith Hill, and every time we think about trying to do something, she books more gigs. <laughs> yeah, so, wow, She's yeah. Very She's becoming more and more popular. She's a she's a fantastic singer and songwriter, and, um, yeah. and it's good for them the family because she she stays very balanced. She doesn't you know she doesn't she's a very balanced young lady anyway. I've known her since she's a baby you know and good. yeah very together anyway. But I think having her family there is, is is very healthy for her for a young woman traveling alone you know having a career. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I hear that your son is a uh, is a very good musician as well, man. He, like he's, <laughs> he's pretty serious. Yeah, this this guy, uh, Akil, he plays guitar, bass, drums, and keyboards, and he makes his living playing every one. He's, he's been touring with Little Big Town for about seven years, I think. And you, he does maybe a third or more of the tracks for a TV show called uh, The Mass Singer. And then there's another TV show. Uh, something family i don't know if they're gonna i don't know if it got picked up for another season but he's part he's part of a team of people in la that that they do these tracks for these tv shows and because he plays everything himself he you know and he never has more than two days to complete the whole track and <laughs> but he can but he's really two days to complete the stuff the whole thing when he plays it live he plays guitar and bass live and guitar and, and keyboards yeah <laughs> he does a lot of stuff as well so yeah he, he yeah. has a, he makes a good living yeah good for you. i my understanding that you were i don't know if you're teach are you teaching at a college nowadays or you used to do it right not anymore i taught for 20 years at belmont university i got you yeah you have an amazing music program there more and more people finally know about it uh, but and they they have an excellent music business program but they also have a, a great music program uh you know for musicians yeah and, and they have, they, so you can study either classical or commercial music. I see. I, if, you do, if you're a commercial percussionist, your instrument is drum set. If you're a classical percussionist, then it's everything, timpani, marimba, you know, the, the traditional symphonic thing. You know. Yeah, good for you, man, good for you. So what is, what is coming up? What are you working nowadays? What is coming up for you? Uh, do you meet playing live or or you? Or? I, I do. I'm, I'll be playing next week. Uh, and here in... So in Nashville, we have so many incredible musicians here. It's crazy. Yeah. But people think they when people figure, oh, you do that. So here they think I only play jazz. <laughs> I've, see, never, I I've never been called for a rock gig in Nashville, which to me is really funny. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. I do a lot of recordings playing rock, of course. Uh, I have a studio in my home, and uh, so I do a lot of my drum tracks here in, in my house. But I. I but I do uh, several studio, you know, several sessions in other studios also. Yeah. Good for you, man. Well, if I'm in town, I would love to uh, go and see you playing live with. Uh, that, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I, I did my. I'd love to meet you and take take you, take you out to dinner. Well, you've been very grateful to me, and I, and of course, I admire you for all the band that you play and all the years. And mu as I said before, music. I'm not a musician, Daryl Chester, and. Um, I, I have been listening to music for many years, and music has given me a lot of satisfaction in my life, man. Mm -hmm. so, and I go once, I see a lot of gigs here in, in the DC area. Yeah, you're in a great place for that. Yeah, they have. Every band come this way, as you know, you're oh, from Baltimore, yeah. Absolutely. Every band. We don't so, get, so we get a lot here, but not, not like there. I mean, yeah. even Atlanta, which is maybe four hours driving from here, has yeah. a lot of 
there was more more variety than we get here. Um, oh yeah, I I saw all Stewart last week, Aldi Miola tonight, Stanley Clark play, wow. and then tomorrow another guy, and then during the summer, I, usually I see close to um I don't know fifty sixty gigs gigs a year. So wow, that's fantastic. My my, my wife complained, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I go but, with my son. My 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 son also, you know, he's twenty and he likes music too. Uh, know, so it's it's a good way to spend time with the family, you know, yes. pursuing your passion and, and and music is a beautiful thing. So many people are into travel and doing stupid stuff. I like music, man. <laughs> man, life. And it's no, I know it's not the same as the record. And you know, you go and see the Commodore or Edwin and Fire. You know, are only one member, two members. It's not the same. I'm aware of that, but uh, but I don't like. I enjoy the music, you know. So. But it, it's it's like theater. I mean, I'd, I'd rather see oh, a absolutely, live, man. Yeah. I'd rather see a live show than a movie because if it if it's acted well, it's it's incredible the feeling you get with a live show. You know. Oh, I, I, absolutely, man. And the the energy from the crowd, and you yes. know, if if you you know the the drum set or the guitar player start two seconds after or before, people look one another. It's okay. But it's part of playing live, like like theater, right? So that, that, right, that's right. right. It's so true. Yeah, yeah, it was very nice talking to you, Chester. Let's stay in touch, and then uh, I will look at your website to see when you're playing, and maybe take like a weekend off, and then go on and see you play. And take, I want to take you out to dinner as well, man. Okay, well, I, I can like say hopefully I can come up there and we can go out and have some crab cakes. <laughs> oh, you bet, man. You betcha. Very it was very nice talking to you. Have a great afternoon, Chester. Thank you. Very good to meet you, and I look forward okay, to. Man. Live, okay. Bye bye. You bet. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, man.